Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. This is Seba. Seba has been written up as one of the top 10 dive destinations in the world. So if you haven't visited us, follow us for a tour, but don't take my word for it. Visit Seba. Now follow the adventures of CNC. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. The Seba National Marine Park encompasses the waters and seabed encircling the island of Seba and the Dutch Caribbean. The Seba Marine Park boasts more than 30 permanently moored dive sites. These dive sites range from easy dive sites to more challenging dive sites for the more experienced diver. Meet Chad and Katie, Sea Saber's new owner since May 2021. But Sea Saber has been around for over 30 years and I believe this is only the third ownership. Saber offers interesting diving at different depths and for every diver's experience and comfort level, from shallow patch reefs to deep water seamounts. There is something for everyone. Sea Saber also works together with the Saber Marine Park to try and eliminate these harmful pesty lionfish. Also be sure to visit Sea Saber's gift shop in Windward Side. been here before the, the Wells Bay is right here this particular site is called Corinth Point uh, this would be the most popular snorkeling site um, on on Saba uh, conditions are really good today flat and calm and no sharks good visibility I cannot guarantee oh, no. that is not <laughs> yet. Come on. we want sharks but often times there's a nice snorkeling in here and you can't get into these little nooks and crannies in this volcanic structure, but today it's really okay. flat, so you can right, right here is close to the island. Please do not touch the island. There are right there, long spine yeah. sea urchins um, right growing right all over the place, so please don't touch everything. And most of you know this is the Seba National Marine Park, so of course don't touch the turtles. Uh, the most common types of turtles we have at this site would be green turtles and hawksbill turtles. You're likely to see uh, one or two or three or four of these. Okay, other things you might see that are bigger, sometimes tarpon. Um, Almost all of the time, barracuda, uh, they're not going to harm you. Uh, sometimes uh, we get both nurse sharks and Caribbean reef sharks swimming in this area. Okay, I would recommend you guys go snorkeling, at very least in buddy teams or as a group. This is still the open ocean, so if anything were to happen, you need a friend there to help. Uh, and if you need my help for any reason, you can just yell my name, Aaron, or this means, hey, I need help. 
And in worst case scenario, the reason why we leave someone on the boat is so the boat can untie and come pick someone up in the event of any type of animal accident. Okay, I uh, recommend you guys store on this side of the boat, not on this side. It gets deeper in this case current, so. Okay, easiest way to enter the water is uh, right here where we picked up the door, so you can enter on either side. Uh, so other than that, you guys have fun. Thank you. Sorry, my emergency recall system. If you hear a whistle, that means please look at the boat. That means for whatever reason, we need to go, someone's gotten hurt, or weather's coming in, or something like that. So a whistle means please return to the boat. Seba has been written up as one of the top 10 dive destinations in the world. The most of our tourists come to Seba for diving and hiking. And I have been promoting diving my entire life. But no, I do not dive. But I do snorkel. So follow us for a snorkel tour. Very fortunate with this perfect weather today. It's so calm and beautiful. so calm we were able to swim in and out of the Torrance cave and we saw turtles and so many fish it was just beautiful unfortunately our GoPro wasn't working and those underwater cases for your cell phone those were not working very well increase in algae cover and decrease in coral cover. Uh, so what we 
What this project wants to do is restore this sea urchin back because for some reason over the last 40 years it hasn't really been very successful. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that that are kind of together creating that right. okay. uh, problem. That's why they haven't come. What's causing the sea urchins to die? What uh, back in the 80s we didn't really have a, a for sure like, indication of what that was because the DNA techniques were not as advanced as they are now. But recently they had a re die off, a re emergence of the disease. And this time it was like a single cell parasite. Um, it was a recent paper out by uh, Ian from Cornell. Uh, I'm sure people have seen that already. They've already been messaging us about it. And they've successfully identified that. Uh, so you guys now are trying to research. I didn't realize the sea urchins were so essential to, to so they, the reef. So they eat the algae away uh, over the rocks and things like that, and they keep it under control. When there's no algae, you promote the ability of coral larvae to settle and grow large and big. Um, wow. So that's their role in the reef. Interesting. That's, when did you start this project? Uh, this project started in 2019. Okay. I joined a, a year after that. Okay. Uh, over here we have some of our nursery plants. Uh, we watch me step yep. on here. <laughs> so we have a couple different methods that we employ to kind of get these urchins. And the first is we have structures that we put out during the summer. And these are called bio balls. It's just a little circle around this size. Uh, it creates little crevices for them. And the larvae are in the water. They're coming from other islands. Uh, or here on Seva that we haven't really for sure found out yet. Uh, they settle on our bio walls and every month we collect them. We clean it out and we get white trays and we just pick them out. And then we raise them from this little one millimeter size individual to some bigger guys that we can put on the reef. So over here we have some that are in that size class. You see here are those really little guys. Goodness, those are really little. So these have already been uh, uh, two months here. Wow. So they're, they're growing away. So how long does it take to be full size like we see them in the... It'll be around like a year, like a big a individual year? like this. Oh. The funny thing is when I lived here and I got hurt by these creatures, I never thought they were a good thing. <laughs> Everybody here thinks we're crazy. They say, oh, why are you going there? They're a pest, you should get rid of them, kill them all. And I said, no, these are really important. They're really great for the reef. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy I understand <laughs> now how important they are. So over here we have some that are a little bit older. Oh, yeah. So Ooh. we've collected these when they were that size, and they just continue to, to grow through here. Wow, interesting. So this is closer towards five, six, seven months. So wow. And when do you put them back out? When they're how old? We have different experiments. Oh, so okay. we're kind of now in the, the phase of trying to figure out what can we do to make it more successful when we put them back. Oh. So believe it or not, even though they have tons of spines, there's a lot of things like to eat them. And when they're in this size, especially the really little ones, a lot of fish will make a meal out of them. Wow. So we try to look at habitat, so get the best habitat possible for them. We also want to look at spaces where there's less predation, so we're figuring out what the predators actually are and then trying to avoid them. Uh, and then we're trying to figure out what size is it that they kind of outgrow their predators. Um, so once they become an adult like this, it's really just uh, queen triggerfish that we think are the primary culprits when it comes to losing them. Wow, I would never imagine that they had predators because they're so well, spiny. <laughs> when they're this size, they're almost like little cuddly kids to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and then uh, what the fish actually do is, of course, this is the, the area where they're most protected. Uh -huh, so I they just peck at it and then they do their best to flip them over and then here's the mouth. In the mouth, you see those spines are much shorter. Yeah. And that's where they go after them. Oh wow, interesting. So right here on the ramp, I see quite a few yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. living into the ramp. Uh, they really seem to be attracted sometimes towards the shallow, protected lagoon areas. So inside the harbor is great for them. Um, you see them clear us out also around those marina areas. That's where uh, they come out. Find them. Interesting. Well, Good luck. This is this is an awesome project. Now that I understand how important they are. <laughs>
because I too thought they were like a menace when I got hurt with them. <laughs> Back in the 60s, they used to take a stick and kill them as they were making a path out to the olive reef. This is also when they used to cut sections in the reef to go swimming. So, <laughs> Well, back in the day, uh, the tide pools down on the airport, I mean, the tide pools were beautiful, but they were packed. With we still cities. are. The tide oh. pools is one of the few places on Sable where you still have a dense sea urchin population. Really? I haven't been yet. I want to go, so... Okay. Well, now I know how important they are, so... Thank you so no much problem. for your time. Thank you, thank you. Glad you uh, enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's quite interesting. We've heard so much about it, so we've been wanting mm -hmm. to come down and yeah, and see it first. My name's Oliver Clockman. I'm originally from North Carolina, and I did a bachelor's of marine biology there at UNCW. And over the last six years, I've been studying in the Netherlands. So I graduated from Wageningen. I have a master's in marine biology, and now I'm a researcher here with the Dining Project. Oh, when you said North Carolina, mm -hmm. it threw me off, but now when you said you went to Holland to school, you have the accent from the, yeah. A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. I'll, I'll show you one last thing that I, I absolutely love about these animals is that they don't have eyes, but their entire body is covered in light sensing cells. So believe it or not, they can see around 20%. So during the day, they are sheltering under rocks usually, and they're kind of in a crevice. And they can see the reef and find those crevices via that light sensing cells. But the other cool thing that they do is that they respond to dark objects coming into their area because that's their defense mechanism. And that which tells them that, okay, I need to put my spines towards the darkness because that's potentially something that wants to eat me. So if you put your hand out in between the light and the urchin, you'll see the spines respond to that. And you see them all suddenly in that, that motion. When he covered over the light. So we'll do that again. Uh, I've overstimulated them already. Is, yeah. so we'll cover this thing, then you'll probably see it a little bit better. You see them all coming, yeah. trying to get mm. Oh my goodness. How interesting. Wow. I will look at these in a whole different light <laughs> light now. It's super interesting. So you put your hand in there and it did not. You would have to really like... You have to give it quite a... Yeah, you can pick it up and it will not... If it's a gentle... It's just like a, a, like a starfish, it has two feet. Uh, so if it walks on your hand, it's just like a little bit of a ticklish feeling. Yeah, so that's the same thing you feel with the... Very interesting. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck. Thank you. Well, you guys look like you have... You know, um, a lot of big ones from the tiny ones over there to this, I'm sure. It's been quite the project, so awesome. So we talked about the bio vaults. Uh, the other method that we do here is we spawn and culture larvae here. So we get a male and a female urchin together, and we give them a temperature shock, and they release their sperm and eggs. We make sure that the fertilization happens. And then uh, this was actually the problem that a lot of researchers had is that they were not able to culture them until adulthood because the larvae kept dying. Uh, and what happens is that a typical method is you use air bubbles to keep them in suspension, but those air bubbles break these abnormally large arms of larval diadema. Uh, so a fellow researcher, a colleague of mine, came up with the shaker table method. So it's just a table that oscillates, and that helps keep the larvae off the bottom of the bottle and allows them to grow until adulthood. So we're the first facility in the Caribbean and the second facility in the world that has the ability to do that now. Wow, that is awesome. <laughs> Good for you guys. You put a save on the map. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. That is wonderful. That's really good information. I'm happy you mm -hmm. got that. <laughs> yeah. This is a pretty interesting vehicle. So what is it? Is it a car or is it a boat? Or is it both?
super nice having a sun with a boat. Today we are heading out on a sunset cruise with Josh and his family under Lady Carolina. Off we go. Gill's Quarter is home to the Future Marina, which is valued at about, I believe, like $30 million. It's going to be awesome. We did a complete tour around the island. Such a beautiful day. It was so calm and pretty. We got to see the plane taking off. This is Stacia into the distance. Just gorgeous.
Mr. Casey, we had a lasagna dinner on our sunset cruise. It was so yummy. Thank you, thank you, Casey. As the sun sets on Sabre, we hope that you have enjoyed this video as much as we have enjoyed making it. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you will not miss our weekly videos.